call and rescue. There are 80,999 calls made every day. Hello, what's the problem? It's the police. Uh, can I have a police? I uh, just stole my money. Who's stole your money? Some are more serious than others. You have me proper evening. I'll take a load of little boy flat on his back for me there. I'm not even flat on his back. On rare occasions, the call is to report a death. Emergency service. I've run over my wife who's been feeding the cows and one of the cows must have known. Some people broke into her house. Okay, okay. You don't know his money. Okay, Tim. <laughs> but what if the caller... She's not moving. Right, she's not moving at all. ...is in fact a killer. Someone being stabbed, I think they did. Canterbury is a lovely city in Kent. It draws thousands of tourists every year because it's got a world-famous cathedral. Canterbury is a very quiet community. It's a, an old medieval town and a very nice place to live. Serious crime isn't really common in Canterbury. In my years of policing in East Kent, I could probably count murders in Canterbury uh, on one hand in 28 years. But on the 29th of March 2016, a violent crime occurred which sent shockwaves across the nation. This was absolutely massive news. Just couldn't have touched my ass. Just started lacking into me. It was just baiting me and beating me and beating me. This could have been a quadruple murder. Simon was a character. He was hilarious. He was really funny. We had a reputation for being loud and lively and outgoing and, you know, being a bit of a joker. He was always up for a laugh. You invite him to your party because he's going to, you know, make it go with a bang. It was good fun to be around. People enjoyed his company. He had quite a lot of bluster. He was loud, but actually he was really soft and soppy. Very compassionate man, a heart really, really, really good hearts. He used to drive me up the wall sometimes because he never stopped talking. But very caring, very caring man, yeah. This is my own business, Simon and Fish and Sons, and I've been in business for myself here for three years. Simon was an aspiring chef. He loved cooking, he loved food, and the fishmongering business he had at the Good Shed in Canterbury I think was probably where he was most happy. And he found himself living in Dickens Avenue because he was separated from his wife, so he, he couldn't stay in the family home. So he was a bit sort of between a rock and a hard place. That's why he sought out temporary accommodation. And the house in Dickens Avenue is just a generic house that has been converted to house several individuals independently. It was run and organised by a, a local housing association. It was semi-detached, two floors, a few bedrooms. It didn't look any different than the others on the street. And it was a place where the council housed people who may have been homeless in the past or had problems trying to get housing of their own. The property was for short-term, temporary accommodation until people were back on their feet and in a position whereby they could then move on into private rented accommodation. So it wasn't intended to be you know, a stepping stone for Simon. Included amongst the residents living at the house on Dickens Avenue was 47-year-old Foster Christian. Foster Christian was quite a large-built male, and quite intimidated in his appearance and his, his mannerisms. His livelihood sort of tended to be more ad hoc. Although he was a qualified mechanic, it wasn't something he was consistently employed in and he tended to make ends meet uh, as best he could. His social group was quite small. And he was a loner. He did have his room upstairs. It was well maintained and he looked after himself. So he was quite steady and had quite a stable living condition and seemed very much to keep himself to himself. The property at Dickens Avenue would have been incredibly difficult in terms of having five people living there. It was very small, 
I think it would have been quite a claustrophobic environment. People tend, tend to spend too much time in their own room, so they were forced to be in communal areas. You had males living there, guys that didn't really know each other, and who would have had relationships, good or bad, from basically living in each other's pockets. Foster Christian lived in that house for seven years. It was quite unusual that he'd been there that length of time. He made it clear that the house was quite a pleasant place to live, but he said that things changed as soon as Simon moved into the house. It wasn't an amicable relationship. It became quite a hostile and violent environment. They were quite volatile towards each other. And on occasions, they had come to blows. The house was quite aggressive. There was fights, there was incidents, police were called out. Foster Christian had perceived that he was bullied and racially abused by other members of the house, and that included Simon. Foster Christian wrote to the Housing Association, the local council, his MP and even a GP, to say that he didn't feel safe in that house and that he needed to move out for his own well-being. Not long after moving into Dickens Avenue, Simon met single mother Natasha Sadler. Where they lived, there was a lake just round the back and she'd have to walk past Simon's house to get to that lake. And I think their paths just kind of crossed. He was in a bad place at that time, and Tasha helped him out. And then, you know, it just kind of blossomed from there, really. Natasha, she was life and soul of the party. Loved her music. Absolutely adored drum and bass. She had lots of friends. Would absolutely help anybody. Tasha had a really vibrant personality. She was very non-judgmental. She was very independent and strong woman. Very free spirit. Yeah, she had a very kind and caring personality and she was very protective. She was a really, really charismatic woman. If she wanted something, she'd always go for it. She'd always get it done. She didn't have a day-to-day -day plan, and she'd always uh, just take every day as if it was your last, really. She was just a really good mum. Simon lived at Dickens Avenue, and obviously my sister lived at her house, and it was maybe a three-minute walk, if that, from her house. They lived very close by. Yeah. Oh, no, he's dead nice. Natasha never confirmed that she was in a relationship, but I could see that they were good friends. They'd spent some time together. Maybe that it was going to blossom into something else. Who knows? He, like, came round quite a lot, and he had, like, decorated the whole house and stuff, and it was really nice of him. Simon was one of the nicest people I've ever come across. When he was first talking about where he lived, I actually thought it was his house and maybe he had a flatmate live with him. I didn't realise the concept that it was a shared house. Natasha was a regular visitor to the house. They liked to drink um, and they would, they would drink and chat um, and share the house with other people that lived there. Boss Chris returned home around 7, 10 in the evening. At that time, Simon was in the shower. The shower and the kitchen are very close together on the ground floor. And Foster's run the cold tap to make himself a cup of tea. And in doing so, he's adjusted the temperature in the shower. The shower has then become hot. And that has burnt Simon whilst he's using it. All people within the property knew that if you ran the cold tap in the kitchen, you adjusted the temperature in the shower. So it was almost an unwritten rule that if someone was using a shower, you didn't run any of the taps in the kitchen. Simon obviously got upset. Idiot. It's not until Simon has left the shower that
that he's realised that it was Foster Christian. That was deliberate. You knew Simon was in the shower. No, I didn't. Natasha became involved. I'm just making a cup of tea. Oh, it was an argument that continued oh, and, oh, and just escalated verbally with threats being made and Foster Christian eventually going up to his room and the arguments continuing from there. This. Come on, we need to talk. They were kind of rowing from room to room. <laughs> Natasha had gone up to his room to complain about his behaviour. She thought that he was deliberately goading Simon. What's all that about? What? You knew Simon was in the shower then. I didn't know he was in the shower. Yeah, you did. You can hear it from here. If I knew he was in the shower, I would have, I would have turned the tap on. You can have a cup of tea at any time you want, and you've chose to do it while he's in the shower to piss him off. I didn't do that, because I ain't got a problem with you. Foster Christian says he listened to what Natasha was saying, then said uh, that he didn't have a problem with her, and then went back into his flat, closing the door. Meanwhile, Natasha's two sons were at their mother's home playing video games. That day was just like any other day, really. Connor had came back from the army. He was on leave for a few weeks. It was Connor who called my mum just to see where she was. He heard like lots of like stuff on the phone, a lot of background noise of um, like people shouting and stuff. So obviously at that point you're going to be a bit like, what's going on there? Where are you? Connor was like the most worried. And he was like, I'm going to go up there and see what's going on. And I was like, OK, I'll come with you. We had been wandering around for a few minutes because we didn't know like the area that well. We passed the address and then brother called my mum again. And she came outside. She looked really shaken and quite like, angry. She led us into the uh, sort of like the hallway and there was this shouting from upstairs and the people were just constant shouting and swearing at each other and it was quite like a crazy environment. What the wrong with you, you prick? We just wanted to get our mum out at that point. We grabbed our mum. We just grabbed her at that point and we was like bringing her out. Nothing in my mind could like comprehend what was about to happen. It's my house! Don't you ever forget that. It's a bitch. Oh, don't you dare! After the collapse of his marriage, Simon Gorecki moved into temporary accommodation in Dickens Avenue. The house was quite aggressive. There was fights, there was incidents, police were called out. On the 29th of March 2016, a vicious assault involving Foster Christian, Simon Gorecki, Natasha Sadler and her two sons erupted in the shared house on Dickens Avenue. <laughs> Yeah, I've just been attacked in my house. You've just been attacked in your house? Yes. Do you need an ambulance at all? Yeah, I think I might be, yeah. Yeah, okay, just bear with me, I'm gonna get somebody to you. As police cars and ambulance services were dispatched, the 999 call operator tried to find out more information from Foster Christian. Who's, who's assaulted you? Right, one of the, um, my housemates, Simon, his uh, and his girlfriend, these boys. How have they attacked you? I just come to my door and started an argument and then he just started lacking into me. Oh, I don't know, they call you a beer can and all sorts of stuff. No one else would ever get to be with me. He's just beating me and beating me and beating me. Hey. Ah. Hello, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was a knife I had, yeah, it was a knife. Yeah. No, I grabbed off of it, yeah. Is the knife still on you? Yeah, I've still got it here, yeah. It's mine and my kitchen knife. I've just grabbed that quick. Okay, and have you used it? Oh, yes, I have used it. Yes, I have used it. Yes. But they just grabbed it back. They grabbed it back. Okay. Uh, and it, do you know which one's taking it back? I don't know. No. Oh. Yeah, the police are right now. Yeah, okay, I'll take the line with the foster, okay? It was absolute carnage in that house when police turned up that night. It was a distressing, harrowing scene. There was a lot of blood on the driveway outside the property and inside it was absolutely horrendous. I've never seen an amount of blood that was there. 
that scene was probably one of the most violent scenes that I've ever seen. Officers and paramedics arrived very quickly at the scene. There were a number of people with serious injuries. Officers, supervisors rushed in to help the victims as much as they possibly could. And the initial treatment by the paramedics was to the teenage lad who could be seen on the drive. And he had had a severe injury to his lower abdomen as well as two stab wounds. Connor had a number of wounds to his arm. Simon Gorecki was in a pool of blood laying on the floor. Natasha slumped up against the wall, both of them in their last moments of their lives. Simon was taken through into the kitchen for CPR and emergency treatments. Natasha, her condition started to deteriorate and emergency first aid was needed to try and resuscitate. But unfortunately, their wounds were too catastrophic and nothing could be done to save them. With life-threatening injuries, both Connor and the teenage boy were rushed to hospital for emergency treatment. I'd just gone to bed. It was around 10 o'clock that I got a phone call. There'd been an accident, all been stabbed. We didn't know how serious it was. So me being me, put the phone straight down, ringing the hospital. Um, yeah, and that's when I discovered how serious it was. I got through to the emergency department, spoke to a woman and said, look, it's my sister and my nephews, I need to know what's going on. And then a policeman come on and he'd said, Connor had been stitched up, he was doing really well. My 16-year-old nephew, still in emergency operating theatre, it was extremely serious and they weren't too sure what the outcome would be of that. I went on to say, well, what about my sister? Where's my sister? What's she doing? And there was a, it felt like a pause for 10 minutes, but obviously it wasn't that long. And he said, I'm sorry, your sister didn't make it. I couldn't actually take it in. It was just, it was, it was like your world comes crashing down and your life's just blown apart. How can somebody take the life of my child? What sort of person does this? You know, it's just like a, it's just like an absolute nightmare. I was decorating a baptism cake. When it was a knock at the door, it was a young man and a young woman. She said, Kent police, may we come in? And I said, is something wrong? So we went in to the sitting room I said, is it Simon? They said, yes. And the police said, there was an altercation and Simon was hurt. That's what the police said. I thought, hurt, okay. So I said, oh, was he badly hurt? Is he all right? And they didn't, off. Oh, their faces said it. I don't believe they said the actual words. I think somebody in your family murdered is like an atomic bomb going off in the middle of your lives, in the middle of your family. And it's catastrophic, yeah, it's catastrophic. Back at the scene, police were questioning Foster Christian. Initially, Foster Christian appeared quite calm, maintained his account that he'd been attacked and that they'd taken the knife. So we took his account on face value, we worked on that. We wanted to try and locate the knife as quickly as possible. We knew that if the potential offenders were Simon, Natasha, Connor and the teenager, well, they'd never left the scene far enough to be able to dispose of the knife too far from it. So we expanded our search outside. They searched the whole house, they searched the garden, but they could not find a single knife which may have been used when we arrived, Foster Christian was out of breath and, and sort of breathing heavily, but was unusually calm. And I think that raised officers suspicion that, that something wasn't quite right with, with what he was saying. His account initially to the 999 was that he'd been attacked and he'd taken a knife off them. Yeah, I've still got it here, yeah. It's one of my kitchen knives. 
That then changed to he wasn't sure where the knife was and then changed back again to that they'd taken the knife from the property after they'd attacked him. So they just grabbed it back. They grabbed it back. That caused us some concern because at one, one point he was quite certain that the knife had gone, then he wasn't, and then he was again. He was also upstairs, so how would he have known where the knife was? When we first got to the scene and his room was looked at, he's a very tidy individual. His bedroom was spotless, the rug was in the same place that it was, and there was one beer can on the floor. This is a small bedroom that would fit on a normal semi-detached house. And the description that he gave of four people bursting into his room with cans and bottles and attacking him, it didn't correspond to the state the room was in. When we put that with all the other evidence, it just didn't seem to, to tally in quite the right way. With two victims dead, two others seriously injured, and Foster Christian's account showing inconsistencies, police made the decision to take Foster Christian into custody. At 7.40 p.m. on Tuesday the 29th of March 2016, Kent police responded to a 999 call. Yeah, I've just been attacked in my ass. On the 999 call, Foster Christian said he had been attacked by Simon Gorecki, Natasha Sadler and her two sons. In self-defense, Foster Christian had fought back. It was absolute carnage when police turned up. It was a violent, harrowing scene. There were a number of people with serious injuries. But as police conducted their investigation, it, it was clear that Foster Christian's story wasn't adding up. Can I still want you? Yeah, I've still got it here. That then changed to a taking the knife. Foster Christian was arrested in connection to the double murder. I'm here outside the house in Dickens Avenue, where last night at around 7.40, police were called here following an alleged stabbing. This crime story was unprecedented. Two people were murdered and two were left for dead, seriously injured. I immediately went to the scene to see what was going on. Local and national media have turned up here today following the story. And as you can see behind me, there's a white tent and police presence, which shows that investigations are continuing. It's believed that the man who has been arrested was known to the victim. Over at Canterbury Police Station, Foster Christian's account was being scrutinised by police. Yeah, there was an argument. Me and Simon. He's something about the water temperature in the shower and me using the tap. He maintained that in the ongoing argument between Natasha and Simon and himself. I was in my room, minding my own business. And they came at me. That Simon and Natasha were the aggressors. Simon had subsequently burst through the door. It was Simon that pulled that knife. He came at me and the, the, the knife had been produced and he'd wrestled it from him and defended himself. Why are you not getting this? Is it because I'm a brother? His demeanour changed during the interview. He, he would go from being quite calm to being slightly aggressive and thinking that we weren't listening to him. I'm black. Is that your problem? He, he would be verbally aggressive towards officers um, and accuse them of uh, you know, potentially being racist towards him and not listening to what he had to say. As Foster Christian remained in police custody, the forensics team continued to analyse the crime scene. Forensic search was extensive. We were quite reliant on forensic techniques such as blood spatter analysis, the amount of blood, the placing of the blood, the placing of, of the bodies and the placing of the injuries. The blood spatter indicate that the stabbing occurred outside Foster Christian's room, not inside as he initially telling us. There was some blood spattering just inside the door to his, his room, the majority of the blood being outside, and then subsequently down the stairs, and then falling at the bottom of the stairs where Natasha and Simon eventually collapsed. When we looked at the forensic evidence, that did discount quite quickly the fact that something had happened inside the room. Um, what had taken place had taken place in the doorway, so that wasn't consistent with the account that he was giving, that he defended himself inside the room. One of our main aims was to locate the weapon because what we couldn't understand was that Christian's account that the offenders had taken the weapon, but it was nowhere 
that we could find close to the scene. So where was that knife? Whilst the forensics team continue their search, over at the hospital, Natasha's teenage son was fighting for his life. My 16-year-old nephew was in life-saving surgery. He'd been, basically, had been disemboweled, stabbed in the bottom right of his abdomen. It pulled out all his bowel, all his muscles. It had also severed the main artery that feeds the blood down to your leg. After hours of life-saving surgery, the teenage boy was placed on a life support machine as doctors attempted to wake him up. I know when I woke up, I was like, what's going on? I was like, saying like, where's, uh, where's my mum to my aunt, eh? Like, I kept saying it. And uh, I, I, I sort of knew at that point you, uh, like I knew uh, that she was gone. But I couldn't really uh, take it in anyway. And uh, I remember that night, it was in intensive care. And uh, I just kept like, I couldn't uh, sleep at all or anything like that. And uh, I think the worst part of all was just being in that hospital and being like feeling so alone in there. The police now had two key eyewitnesses to the brutal attack. Natasha's sons, Connor and Brandon. Whilst they waited for Brandon's condition to improve before interviewing him, police were still desperate to find the murder weapon. The whereabouts of the knife was a mystery until a late police report came in. When the police first arrived at the scene, one of the officers noticed that there was a woman leaving the property and she was hunched over as if she was concealing something. Not only did they notice this woman, but they also recognised her face and even knew her by name. And her name was Naomi Toro. Naomi Toro was known to us. The officer had recently dealt with her and she was a friend of Foster Christians. Both were into the drug scene in Canterbury and we both led a very similar lifestyle. So we think that they'd known each other for a period of time. Um, and were possibly in an intimate relationship. Foster Christian had never mentioned, and nobody else had mentioned, that Foster Christian had had any friends at the property. So it was unusual that she was there and that she was leaving. With this new information, Naomi Toro was brought in for questioning and revealed a very sinister version of events. Naomi Toro was out with another girl, Samantha Greenbridge. Hello. And she took a call from Foster Christian. Yeah. OK, be there in a bit. We're going to Foster's. She turns up at the house. Walks up the stairs, goes into Christian's room, and he hands her the blood-soaked knife. She then steps over Natasha's body out the house past the teenager who was on the floor fighting for his life and then leaves the scene as police and paramedics arrive. Hold this. And then she drove her friend Samantha Groombridge home and then passed the knife to Groombridge to secure the knife for her. The following day, Naomi Toro gets the knife back drives to the River Stour in Fordwich and then launches the knife into the river. Police then send a search team to dive into the river to try and find the murder weapon. And after extensive search, the knife was found and recovered. Extensive forensic examination was conducted on the murder weapon. We were looking for DNA, fingerprints, any bit of evidence we could to connect that weapon to Christian and to the murders. But unfortunately, due to the time they had been in the water, we, we were unable to recover any forensic evidence from it. 
With Naomi Toro's confession and the eyewitness accounts of Natasha's sons, police were sure that Foster Christian's account of being attacked was a lie. Is the knife still on you? Yeah, I've still got it here, yeah. It's one of my kitchen knives. And he was charged with the murders of Simon and Natasha. I was really apprehensive. I had no idea what to expect. And as it turned out, I wasn't really apprehensive enough. The first day, I remember turning up sort of fairly jittery. We were told that he would enter a plea of not guilty uh, on the grounds of he used reasonable force to defend himself. When you get in that courtroom, everything changes. Everything changes. It's almost like it doesn't matter how much evidence you've got. They can say what they want, when they want. There's lots of family there from, from both sides, but it was a, a, a tense situation. Foster Christian's defence was that he was the victim and had used reasonable force against his attackers. Foster Christian maintained that he was the victim. He came running through the door right at me with a knife. He disarmed Simon Gorecki and got him in a headlock. He acknowledged that he'd used a knife, but he didn't know what he was doing. I was flashing my arms around trying to defend myself. He was being attacked. He had sustained a small cut over his eye. He couldn't see. He wasn't thinking straight. He doesn't remember. He used reasonable force to defend himself and he didn't know, you know how these two people came to be stabbed the way they were. He felt he was the victim in this, but that seemed to be how Foster Christian perceived himself throughout, that he was, he was always the victim. He was confident in his delivery of his account. He was quite arrogant and dismissive of the family. He was goading the family. It was very relaxed, very arrogant would turn and maybe look at us a couple of times, just put in a face and sticking his nose up in the air, like, oh, I'm going to get away with this. And I actually thought, I actually believed he would. On the 5th of October 2016, Foster Christian's murder trial commenced at Maidstone Crown Court. Accused of killing Simon Gorecki and Natasha Sadler and seriously wounding her two sons, Foster Christian claimed self-defense. I was flashing my arms around trying to defend myself. Foster Christian maintained that he was the victim, that they had attacked him, that he disarmed Simon Gorecki and got him in a headlock and reached over and uh, whilst holding him in the headlock, uh, stabbed him in the uh, in the back and gave um, uh, a description on, on how that had happened. He was demonstrating to the court physically what had happened doing this. He kept doing this with his hand. And the judge stopped him at that point and actually asked him to do it again. He said, show, show that to the jury. And he went slightly to an angle and started doing it again. The post-mortem on both Natasha and Simon's bodies showed a very different version of events. Post-mortems were horrendous. Natasha's wounds were, were to the front. One was a direct stab that went through her chest and, and penetrated her heart, and the other was a, uh, a stab down um, across her left, just above her left eyebrow. It was a long penetrating wound. It went through her forehead, down behind her eye, and then down coming out just below her jawline. These were deliberate, powerful stab wounds, which would indicate someone was unable to move at the time that the injuries were delivered, but trying to get away. Simon had been stabbed five times in the back, I believe once through his lung. Simon's wounds would indicate that he was running down the stairs at the point that he was stabbed because the injuries seemed to go in, a, in an arc. It started to go down the stairs at the top of the stairs where Foster Christian's room was placed. He was stabbed in the lower back and as he's got lower down the stairs, the injuries have come higher up. They were quite focused, targeted wounds and they were repetitive uh, and not just to one person, to four separate people. That's not defence, that's an attack and that's a brutal attack on four different people. 
As the trial continued, the prosecution presented to the jury what police believed to be the actual events of that fateful night in Dickens Avenue. The argument had started as Foster Christian alleged in that he had run a tap, which had made the temperature in the shower alter, <laughs> scalding Simon Gorecki. This was quite antagonistic of Foster Christian and was clearly to start an argument. Natasha stood up for Simon, believing that Foster Christian had overstepped the mark with bullying and intimidating Simon, and the argument continued. The prosecution called one of their key witnesses, Natasha's son, Brandon. I think it was Connor who called my mum, just to see where she was, I think. He heard like lots of like stuff on the phone, a lot of background noise of um, like, people shouting and stuff. And he was like, I'm going to go up there and see what's going on. And I was like, OK, I'll come with you. We passed the address, and then brother called my mum again. And she came outside. She looked really shaken and quite a lot angry. She led us into the hallway, and there was this shouting from upstairs, and the people were just constant shouting and swearing at each other, and it was quite like a crazy environment. What the hell's wrong with you, you prick? Nothing you in my mind could like, comprehend what was about to happen. We just wanted to get our mum out. Like a teenager. We grabbed her mum. I just grabbed her at that point, and we was like bringing her out. This is my house, bitch. Oh, we were standing outside and uh, he was standing in his doorway. Just tell me what you just said then. And my mum was confronting Foster. Connor was trying to calm the situation down. At that point, Connor couldn't see a knife but could see a, a yellow plastic bag in Foster Christian's hand. And then it just went totally, totally crazy. <laughs> Somehow I made it down the stairs. The first thing I did was like look down and I saw like sort of like my guts hanging out. Connor was there with me and I was like, I'm hurt. I was like, I'm gonna die to him basically. He just kept reassuring me like I'm not. We made it outside and I was just sitting there like thinking I was like dead at that point. <laughs> but I'd accepted my fate. I was that sure of it. So at that point, Foster Christian quite calmly hatches a plan as to what he's going to do. Foster Christian picks up his phone and rings one of his good friends, Hello. Naomi Toro. Yeah. He needs to find a way to get rid of this murder right. weapon. We're going to Foster's. Foster Christian then rings police and recounts a narrative of a victim who's been violently attacked. Can please have an emergency? Yeah, I've just been attacked in my ass. You've just been attacked in your house? Yeah. Do you need an ambulance at all? Yeah, I think I might be, yeah. I could see what he was doing and that he was already setting the scene to try and blame Simon and Natasha. They just come to my door and started an argument and then he just started letting into me. Okay. <sighs> Straight away, he started to build his defence. Straight away. And that was quite a smart thing to do, wasn't it, to call the police and say he'd been attacked. Uh, that happened to me with bottles, I don't know what else they had on them. OK, who did you use the knife on? All of them were attacking me. I don't know. I don't no, know. OK. I don't know. Halfway through, we hear a kind of commotion. Is the police coming? Yeah, yeah, we're coming. Is the police coming? OK. Yeah, yeah, we're ah. coming, and then there's an ambulance coming as well. And a female's voice. We, we obviously realised that was when Na Naomi Toro arrived at the house to take the knife away. Please get rid of it. Where? I don't know anywhere. The police are coming now. There's a lot of panting. Some of it seems a bit over dramatic. <laughs> at that point, he starts saying to the operator, uh, "They've grabbed it back. They've grabbed the knife back." But well, they just grabbed it back. They've grabbed it back. Then it, do you know which one's taking it back? I don't know. No. Oh. The calmness with which Foster Christian was making this version of events that had taken place and himself to be the victim in such a calm manner, I thought, was just quite disturbing. When you look at the fact that he was hatching a plan of disposing of the weapon, making the arrangements, as well as talking and, and reporting this 999, if it just showed to me how calculating and cold he actually was.
As the trial drew to a close, there was one more shocking revelation to emerge. Foster Christian was a man with a dangerous and violent past. He'd been sentenced on a number of occasions for excessive violence and use of weapons and, and causing injury to people. In 1985, he attacked somebody with a knife at a football game and he was sent to prison for 15 months. In 1989, he attacked a bouncer with a, a screwdriver. In 2003, he threatened a man with an axe. He was given a two-year sentence. He had a string of convictions. I think it was 31 by the time he'd gone on trial. He had already been to prison twice for a Section 18, twice. The one down from attempted murder, wound him with intent. He's had two of those previously. On each of those occasions, he alleged that he was the victim. I was trying to defend myself. He is the type of person that once he is detained and arrested, refuses to take responsibility for his actions. He had a history for liking weapons. He was a ticking time bomb. He should never, ever have been living in that HMO. After a three-week trial, the jury were dismissed to consider their verdict. You're relying on 12 total strangers to decide whether or not this person has committed murder or whether they were defending themselves. My heart was racing. I've never felt anything like it in my life. I've never been that nervous. It feels as though you're going to have a heart attack. It feels as though you're going to die. And the foreman came forward and stood up. Have you reached a verdict upon which you all agree? We have, Your Honour. We find the defendant, Foster Christian, guilty on two counts of murder. Both families, you could see the tension drain, the relief uh, that justice had been done, um, and the emotions that then spilled out from them were, were you know, completely understandable. That thing does not deserve to be alive. It just doesn't deserve to be alive. You know, life, life is nothing to him, nothing. It's just, it's just smashed us apart. This is what Natasha was wearing that night. That's all her blood splatter up there. And this is her phone. Just full of her blood. She must have tried to phone someone. But there's some stub marks here. But how can justice ever really be served? Because Simon's still dead. Natasha's still dead. He's my son, I'm never going to feel OK about it, am I? Never. I know some people, they want to, like, forgive and they want to uh, forget to move on, but there's some things that you can't forgive and there's some things you can't, like, forget ever. I feel like I'll never truly move on like, with my life again. Hopefully, with uh, some help, I'll, uh, I will get past it, but... Right now, it's, uh, I guess it's helping. But it's just taking, uh, it's taking its time.